Okay, let's open our Bibles again to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 7. Nehemiah, chapter 7. And let's go back where we left off last time. Nehemiah 7, verses 63 to 65. Those three verses. <clears throat> and of the priests, the children of Habiah, the children of Koz, the children of Barzillai, which took one of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, to wife, and was called after their name. These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but it was not found. Therefore were they, as polluted, put from the priesthood. And the Tershatha said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things, till there stood up a priest with Urim and Thummim. The word them, verse 63, is probably a reference to Barzillai himself. There's some mixed blood um, involved. Verse 64 says, These sought their register among the, those Levites, that were reckoned by genealogy, but it was not found. That is, they couldn't prove they were qualified as priests. They couldn't prove their uh, descent from Ezra's line, which came from Aaron. Go back to the previous book, to book of Ezra, chapter 7. <laughs> Ezra 7. And let's read the first six verses there. Now after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra the son of Sereah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitab, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Mereoth, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Uzi, the son of Buki, the son of Abishua, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. The governor over this, all of this organizing, called the Tershatha, was probably a reference to Nehemiah himself uh, by this time. And he makes a judgment <clears throat> that they couldn't function as real priests until they could prove their genealogy. I want you to go back uh, to a couple of references. Go to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 23. 1 Samuel 23. And we'll begin there at verse 9. 1 Samuel 23, starting at verse 9. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul secretly come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. Then David and his men, which were about six hundred, arose and departed out of Keilah, and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah, and he forbear to go forth. David abode in the wilderness in strongholds, and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. By the way, this is an excellent anti-Calvinism passage, because here God tells David directly, Saul is going to come after you, his men are going to pursue after your men, and they're going to take you captive. That was God's stated will. He, he told him exactly what's going to happen. How did David escape it? Just go somewhere else. They couldn't catch him. 
So you're able to, you are able to contend with the stated will of God in the scriptures by simply doing something else. You can rebel against the, the desire of God, the Bible says, and everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Well, you can overthrow the will of God by not giving thanks. It's the idea of Calvinism that God has designed and foreordained every event in the universe, and you have no free will whatsoever, is a lot of hooey. But uh, also go forward to 1 Chronicles 10. 1 Chronicles 10. First Chronicles 10 and two verses there, verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> so Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it, and inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him, and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. Now the point I want to make here is the only way to show of these men uh, who could function as priests would have to come from direct or divine supernatural revelation at this time by the Urim and Thummim, as our text said. Let's look at the references to those words, or seven in the Bible. Go back to the book of Exodus 28. Exodus 28. Exodus 28, and verse 30. Thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord, and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. Go forward to Leviticus 8. Leviticus 8. And verse 8. And he put the breastplate upon him. Also, he put in the breastplate the Urim and the Thummim. Numbers 27. Numbers 27. And um, verse 21. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim, because the Lord at his word shall, shall they go out. Excuse me. Uh, at his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 33. Deuteronomy 33, verses 8 and 9. And of Levi he said, Let thy Thummim and thy Urim be with thy Holy One, whom thou didst prove at Massa, and with whom thou didst strive with the waters of Mirabah, who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, neither did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they have observed thy word and kept thy covenant. The tribe of Levi showed itself worthy to receive God's revelations as the future priesthood. 1 Samuel 28. 1 Samuel 28, and verses 6 and 7. First Samuel 28, verses 6 and 7. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And the servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. 
By the way, the old TV show Bewitched, back in the 60s, the mother-in-law's name was Endora, based on that story. That was his sin against the Lord, uh, inquiring at a witch who had a familiar spirit, and evidently the spirit she would contact would imitate whoever the client wanted to contact, wanted to reach, and tell them what they wanted to hear. So like, you know, fortune tellers now, or people that read your palms or read your tarot cards or any number of things, they tell you what you want to hear, sort of like uh, what a lot of modern psychologists do. They tell the patient or their client what the client wants to hear to keep the client coming back. They keep them coming back. You know, they tell them, listen, the mess you've made is your mess. And you have no one to blame but yourself. You can't blame your parents. You can't blame your school teacher. You can't blame your somebody else. You made a mess of your life. You need to own up to it. What client is going to go back to that counselor again? So they tell them what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. And in Ezra, Ezra 2... Ezra 2, <clears throat> verses 62 and 63. <clears throat> These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore were they as polluted put from the priesthood. And the Tershathah said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and with Thummim, which is almost an exact quote from Nehemiah's reference, which we read a minute ago. We have to admit the Bible doesn't tell us much about the Urim uh, and the Thummim. It doesn't even tell us what they were. They weren't special glasses, so Joseph Smith could translate the Book of Mormon. We, I think we could safely say that. Um, the Bible doesn't even tell us what they were precisely. Were they gemstones? Were they some form of precious stone? Were they precious metals? The Bible doesn't specify. It doesn't give the, enough details. They were put inside the high priest's breastplate, and on the front of that breastplate you had 12 stones, 12 gemstones, representing each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And apparently what we have here is the 12 gemstones would light up. Thus, giving the answer, or indicating the answer from the Lord to the person who was inquiring. You can, you know, a lot of word puzzle games, we used to play Boggle, because that was sort of a, a common man's version of, of uh, Scrabble. Boggle is as far as I ever got. A lot of people like Scrabble. See how many words you can pick out of a, just a few, few group of letters, small group of letters. Hebrew has 22 consonants with no vowels to it. And uh, they had a system of vowel points back in the 800s. These Masoretic uh, Jewish priests had invented sort of make pronunciation uniform, but they dropped those. They don't even use them in uh, the state of Israel today. Somehow context between two people indicates what the subject matter is and how to understand each other. But without vowels, it's kind of a tricky proposition. You have the letters B, K, with no, with no vowels. Does it represent the word book? Does it represent the word bake? Does it represent the word bike? Without vowels, it's sometimes ambiguous. Is it Burger King? You don't know. However, it seemed to be that the breastplate would light up with different stones. Twelve would be sufficient, evidently, to indicate the answer God would give to the one inquiring. Saul got no success with it. He wasn't a Levite, and he was in rebellion against God. So he went to find a witch with a familiar spirit. That was his great sin. Aaron, Moses' brother, was a Jewish priest, and so were all the Levites. 
before God separated the Gentiles and the Jews, we would say that Melchizedek, the one Abraham paid tithes to, the book of Genesis, was a Gentile priest. Hebrews 3, verse 1, tells us, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. A proper and a sufficient priest has to be revealed by God. And that's uh, what Nehemiah suggested they wait for. Some priest who had Urim and Thumma and received revelation from God when he inquired at it. Notice verse 64 again. These sought the re in our text, these sought the register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but it was not found. Therefore were they as polluted, put from the priesthood. We can have some fun and ask, how can a million unmarried bachelors, many of whom have mental and sexual problems and have a, a worldwide explosion of child abuse scandals in every major city in the world, haunting them right now, how can those men qualify as spiritual priests? What could they do for us or for anybody? You have something that they need, but they've got nothing you need. Uh, go forward to the book of Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I think I may return to this text on Sunday as we continue the book of Hebrews in Sunday school. But Hebrews 13 and start there at verse 10. Hebrews 13, beginning at verse 10, We have an altar, where they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts, animals, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. That's outside the city of Jerusalem. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Our sacrificial offering on an altar isn't contained in some building, not in any church building. It was completed on the cross of Calvary Amen. when the Lord Jesus died as a substitute for sinners and a sacrifice for sins. That's where it was. God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is how God demonstrated his love to the world by sending his only begotten son to be born a man, live among men, walk among men. He can identify with men, be tempted victoriously, um, unlike men who fail, and then without any sin of his own, on his own record, die as a substitute for the guilty. Our sacrifice was completed by the work and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, every believer is a priest in a priesthood, including females. Go forward to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2, this is something every Christian should be able to Find their place in 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. He also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God and Jesus Christ. Verse 9. But here, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's something every Christian man or woman should be able to identify with. Let's finish reading the chapter, Nehemiah 7, verses 66 through 73. The whole congregation together was forty and two thousand three hundred and three score, beside their manservants and their maidservants, of whom there were seven thousand three hundred and thirty and seven, 
and they had 240 and 5 singing men and singing women. Their horses, see, they're, they're even the, the function of singing praises to God in the temple, in the rebuilt temple, uh, was not limited to men. Women could do it as well. I, had a, I read a guy's article. He said he didn't like Fanny Crosby as a hymn writer because Fanny Crosby is trying to, in, in effect, teaching Bible doctrine, and she's not a man. She's one of the greatest Christian hymn writers that ever lived. And uh, to say that I, I'm not going to appreciate her hymns or get anything from her um, uh, writing and her music because uh, she was a woman, not a man, and women aren't supposed to be teaching men. That, that's somebody who's uh, so scriptural, he's unscriptural. But <clears throat> verse 68, their horses 730 and 6, their mules 240 and 5, their camels 430 and 5, 6,720 asses, and some of the chief of the fathers gave under the, under the work. The Tershatha gave to the treasure a thousand grams of gold, 50 basins, 500, um, excuse me, and 30 priest garments, and some of the chief of the fathers gave to the treasure of the work 20,000 drams of gold, 2,200 pounds of silver, that which the rest of the people gave was 20,000 drams of gold, 2,000 pounds of silver, threescore and seven priests' garments. So the priests and the Levites and the porters and the singers and some of the people and the Nethanims, Nethanims were simply assistants to the priests. They weren't priests, they were assistants. And all Israel dwelt in their cities. And when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. These verses were... Uh, covered effectively uh, when we were back in Ezra, I think, chapter 2, a few months ago, several months ago. So we don't need to dwell on it much. The, the list of numbers of how many people were assembled, how many uh, beasts, asses, so forth, were gathered to do the work uh, of the rebuilding. Verse 73 says, When the seventh month came, the seventh month is prominent in Israel and uh, to the kingdom of the Messiah. So, and I'll give you, for time's sake, I'll give you the references. You can write them down, study them on your own, if you're writing them down. Solomon publicly dedicated the temple in the seventh month. 1 Kings 8 tells us. Christ's birth came in the seventh month. I'll give references for that. We studied them all together. John 1, 14, Luke 3, 23, 1 Chronicles 24, about verse 17, I think. The course of Abiah, it lists the course of the priests in their order, in a rotating schedule, and the, the family of Abiah, his, his family, served at a certain time, and that was John the Baptist's family. They served a certain time of the year, and uh, John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus was. So, while well, Jesus wasn't born in December, Jesus was conceived, or Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost in December and was born in September. If you match the the uh, months as closely as you can, as approximately as you can, Christ's second advent will come in the seventh month. I'll give you some references for that. Zechariah 14, verses 16 to 19. In fact, let me have you turn to one verse, one place. Psalm, Psalm 19. Maybe we'll have you turn to two places. Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verses 4 and 5. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words in the end of the world. In them have he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as one, excuse me, as a strong man to run a race. As a bridegroom. Go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17.
Matthew 17 and uh, verses 1 to 4. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth him up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto, unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias, indicating the time of the year this event took place as a foreshadow of Christ's glorious return at the end of the tribulation, the beginning of his millennium. Uh, the word tabernacle should be matched with every other usage of the word tabernacle. That occurred in the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar. In fact, the word <coughs> September was the old seventh month in the old world calendar. September, October, November, December, uh, from Latin words, means 7, 8, 9, 10. They still mean that. And uh, we, so the beginning of the year was approximately March, the old world calendar, and uh, off the top of my head, I'm not sure when the world began to adopt January as the beginning of the new calendar year. However, the old world calendar began around March, which corresponded with the first month in the Hebrew calendar, more or less. Uh, of course, we have 365 days in our solar calendar, and we have a, a, a leap year, a leap day, every four years. The Jews, I understand... I had a 30-day month cycle, and they would have to add an extra month every few years to have the numbers match the close, uh, approximately match the uh, calendar of the rest of the world. And figuring out exactly what year we're in, in God's chronology, God's calendar, when exactly Christ would come back, that that is a very painful, tedious exercise. I don't think anyone should waste their time worrying about it. The Lord Jesus said, you know not what uh, um, the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Bob Jones Sr. was a young man, and he would walk up to preachers and say, um, do you think the Lord's coming back today? And the uh, older preachers, well, he, he might. No, but do you believe he's coming back today? Well, I'm not sure, but do you think so? Well, from the things I see, I don't, I don't think it'd be today. And then Bob Jones would say to the old preacher, Well, the Lord Jesus said, In such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. And great precocious young preacher in those days. Well, we'll stop right there, and we'll pick up, Lord willing, chapter 8 next time. Uh, let's pray, and we'll ask God to conclude these thoughts for us tonight. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would dismiss us from this meeting with your kindness and your grace. Keep everybody safe driving back home. And again, I appreciate the effort they made to be with us tonight. We're, we miss a few that are normally with us. They're out of town or they're not with us tonight. We ask you to minister to them. We ask that this would be helpful and a little bit instructive to us as we go through the Bible. Help us to be good students. Help us to keep our minds clear and outside distractions to be kept outside. And we'll thank you for that in advance. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.